This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in everyone to this week's edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Strozinski. On today's show, more information on Vince McMahon and sex trafficking. Also, we've got Splitsville for this on-scene and real-life couple. And this AEW wrestler has to po- postpone his plans. Of course, we're going to get into all of that much, much more at the back end of the show. You know we're going to be breaking down AEW. You know we're going to be breaking down WWE. Help me sort through this week in wrestling chaos. He's the one. He's the only. He tells me to be the man. You got to beat the man because he is the man. He is the doc, John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Or you could say CEO, CEO. Yeah, it's a great time to be talking wrestling. Boy, has AEW leveled up. And yeah, there's a lot of criticism regarding the risky wrestling moves their performers take, their presentation. But when you look at it, there may never be a free agent stretch where a company can land Will Ospreay, Kazuchika Okada, and the artist formerly known as Sasha Banks, the CEO, Mercedes Monet, in a stretch of time within two months. And my goodness, was AEW, I think, putting themselves in a position to really start their trek to compete with the WWE. Now, when you got those stars, you can kind of get that, I would say, that foundational setup that you need. They still got a long and a lot of work to do, but my goodness, WWE has been on fire. AEW, TNA, man, wrestling in 2024 is at a peak position, and I'm excited to talk about it because it was a good week with the buildup to WrestleMania, AEW, is now building toward their April pay-per-view. I was excited this week, and no show to me lagged, except obviously 20-minute promos tend to kind of make you go, come on, man, wrap this up. But in the end, this week of wrestling was among the best that we've seen in a long, long time. Yeah, it really was a really good week of wrestling. And you know what? I think I want to start there. You mentioned the the, the 20-minute long promo. And this isn't on our rundown, but I think you bring up a really good point. So I just want to tackle it if we may. Now, every time The Rock and Roman Reigns come out, it is anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes of screen time. And on Friday night, The Rock got at least 20 minutes of screen time where he could sit there and sing and cut a promo and do some of his old bits, uh, use some of his old music, and was basically playing the classics. But again, taking up at least 20 minutes to do it. Now, I was excited that Roman wasn't there because if Roman was there, they each get 20 minutes. It's like somewhere written in the contract where if the rock gets 20, Roman gets 20. So we together, we get 40. Let's go. These promos that these guys are doing while they're entertaining, I think they kind of take away from some of the show. And I think they kind of stall out some of this build towards WrestleMania because this week we had a 20 minute promo from the rock. And I feel like we got more done for everybody else than we have in previous weeks. You've got Randy Orton and Kevin Owens getting a match. Uh, Damage Control got a match. You really helped push that Bayley storyline along. Uh, You had, on on Monday Night Raw, you had uh, Sami Zayn getting his WrestleMania dues, and we're going to get into that because by him getting the win, he ousts another guy who might have been a little bit more deserving. But with these 20 and 40-minute promos, you really hamstring the show and you really hamstring the storytelling And I feel like they might need to dial that back. They might need to take some of that time away from The Rock and take some of that time away from Roman Reigns because there is a whole other card. I know these guys are are basically main eventing two nights at WrestleMania, and I get it. So you want double the time, but you got to help build out the rest of the card. And that's what really makes WrestleMania special. It's not just that main event. It's the entirety of the card that makes that main event show that special. Did you find it a little bit easier to digest with only having The Rock there, only getting the 20 minutes instead of the usual 40, clipping some of that time to kind of build out and and really give other people some time to elaborate on their stories? And does that have you a little bit more invested in what's going on for WrestleMania? 
Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking when you look at the product, I thought that there was a little bit of things that needed to be kind of tidied up. Now, some things I didn't like, obviously, with Kevin Owens and Randy Orton, I just think that, man, a triple threat, I understand it makes sense. It's logical with where Kevin Owens is, and especially with what came out of the Elimination Chamber. But I just think Randy Orton's a bigger star. You could have just had Kevin Owens against Logan Paul, in my opinion, or you could have just had Logan Paul against Randy Orton, and you just figure something out for Kevin Owens. But that's what it is. That's what they decided to do. I thought SmackDown took the time after the 20 minutes to really establish what they needed to. But yeah, you look at it, and it made sense because obviously The Rock has a a deep, tight connection with Memphis, the town, because he started his career there. And it was crazy. The crowd was really into The Rock. And I think yeah. actually, he almost seemed like he was a face instead of a heel. It carried the segment in the end because the crowd was into it. And the the singing, I think you could have cut one song out. I think you could look if you in my mind, I just think that, you know, when we do podcasts, we record just a, maybe a minute or two longer and we cut it down a little bit just to save a little space, take out some things that maybe are irrelevant and make it as clean as possible. I think that if you're WWE and your and your timing is when you lay out this, the sheet and you see rock 20 minutes, I just think someone's got to go all the time. We got to just trim five minutes. 15 minutes so that you can give one more person a promo. I think the more you can get in, I know that sometimes people do have ADD, but at the same token, 20 minutes of television time, even if it's for The Rock, who's now calling himself the final boss, it's just a little bit too much time. You can use that five minutes so wisely. It's precious. And I just think that even if you, even if you would have cut that and let LA Knight talk for two minutes more, and then AJ Styles gets the extra two minutes as he's standing over there where he goes, I accept, and it's, it's rushed. You could just simply have that extra five minutes go to that where you go, you're going to come out here. AJ Styles can go out there looking, uh, take the microphone as he's sitting on uh, LA Knight, which is, I, I, th- I give him credit because that looked tough to kind of hold a chair into your throat. You, he looks into LA Knight and just talks to him and says, hey, you're going to come out here and disrespect me. Who do you think you are? You're a has-been, you're a wannabe, and you're a flash in the pan, and I'm going to show you why AJ Styles is going to dominate you at WrestleMania, which is my land, not yours. And, and, and you just get more. But, mm-hmm. y- you know, in my mind, I just think that The Rock has free reigns, and it's unfortunate because I just think that it's taking away just a little bit, not a lot. It's still very entertaining. The Rock is over. His new music is over. The crowd really likes him. And in certain parts, you could even make the case that The Rock, if he gets a full year, a run, man, he could do some things for Cody, Roman, and maybe even one more performer with some feuds that he could have. And it's it's a good run, but it's just too long. Five minutes in, in any scenario of television or podcasting or on-air time is so precious. I just think it could be used wisely. Yeah, and, and just to kind of touch on two things that you said there, because you, you laid out a lot of great points. The Rock in his run, it sounds like it'll probably be done after WrestleMania, which is kind of unfortunate because oh. he's coming. He's laid a lot of good groundwork where, like you said, he could if he had a good year in him, even a good six months, you could do a good six-month run and, and tell some really good stories and put some guys over. But it sounds like he'll be back in the acting studio after WrestleMania. So uh, the rules of the land are, and it's because of The Rock, it's actually because of The Rock and John Cena and their WrestleMania match. Where if you are if you're gonna film a movie, you're not allowed to wrestle because you might blow out your quad, might blow out your groin, might blow out your ab, and then uh, you'll be sidelined like The Rock was. Um, but also, you you brought up uh, Randy Orton, you brought up Kevin Owens, you brought up Logan Paul, and I'm with you. Me and you aren't really into these into these triple threat or fatal four way matches. They're some of our least favorite matches. Sometimes they make sense, right? If you really build this really chaotic, awesome story, it makes sense. Kevin Owens, I almost feel like he's been inserted into into this feud between Kev, between Randy Orton and, and Logan Paul. I, look, I know Kevin Owens and Logan Paul have a history. I get it. But it really felt like that was the beginning of the year history and not so much the history that's going on right now. Right now, it really does feel like Randy Orton and Logan Paul have a thing going on. I really liked what I seen on Friday night with the stunner into the RKO. I thought that was sweet. I thought that right there, that's the new finishing move. I like how they shook hands. They're like, did we just become best friends? I thought that was great. (laughs) Going off of that momentum that you had there, instead of doing a triple threat match, I would have much rather have seen a tag match with these two. Just a one-night-only tag match at WrestleMania. You can do all the stuff to build to it, 
But one night only at WrestleMania, you've got Logan Paul, and Logan Paul has to grab somebody to wrestle in a tag match with him. It could be KS1. It could be whomever. doesn't matter to me. But the finishing move and the way that match is going to finish, it is going to be a stunner from Kevin Owens into an RKO for Randy Orton for the 1-2-3, and that's going to send me home happy from WrestleMania. Instead, you've got this really decent build over the last couple weeks where Kevin Owens and Randy Orton have kind of been, I don't know, growing together, bonding a little bit. Uh, Yeah, Randy Orton almost hit Kevin Owens with the RKO, and you know that at some point that was probably going to come. But for right now, for where we're at, these two, honestly, they look like stepbrothers. You know what I'm saying? It looks like Will Ferrell and uh, the other guy. I can't remember his name. But, like, did we just become best friends? Yes, we did. You want to go play karate in the in the garage? Let's go. That's that's the vibes I'm getting. And you're now inserting them in this triple threat match. And I just feel like it doesn't do anything to move Randy Orton's current story along. I feel like Kevin Owens now gets inserted into this to help move his story along. When really and truly, the meat and potatoes is Randy, o- Randy Orton, Logan Paul. That's what we had coming out of Elimination Chamber. That was the big talking point, one of the big talking points coming out of that match at Elimination Chamber. And now inserting Kevin Owens just doesn't make sense. Would you have rather have seen these two as a tag team, or would you have just rather have seen Randy Orton versus Logan Paul, and that's it, we're done? Yeah, that's it, we're done. I think, you know, it just, and, and what's crazy is Randy Orton is a star. But it just seems like when he's come back, he's kind of been put right back in the middle, which is crazy. I just think that, you know, I get it. He'll do a lot. He'll do wonders with Logan Paul in the ring. And anywhere he goes, he's going to really make the stars look a lot better because of what he brings to the table, his aura. But it just feels like, you know, in a big moment that maybe you would have put him, you know, they're not on the same show, but Gunther, like he's at the level of a higher situation. The U.S. title is great, but it has more of a feel of a TV title the way it is now. You got it on a on an influencer. You don't got it on a hardcore wrestler. So it's just I look at it, and and it's just in, in regards to the level of where a person's at. You think bigger. It's WrestleMania 40, the granddaddy of them all, a big show, and Randy Orton is like firmly in the middle, and it it just stinks because. You know, it's sometimes that that is the byproduct of having a lot of stars like AJ Styles, like LA Knight, like Randy Orton. They're not in the big moment. And it's crazy because you think of guys like uh, Jimmy Uso and Solo, and they still got some more work to do to get their stuff over and to do more work for their feuds. So it's crazy because Randy Orton can't get a top three match at WrestleMania. That's crazy. But, you know, they'll make it work. And it'll be intriguing. It'll be interesting. Because I guess the question is just at, in the beginning, do you have Logan go over? Do you have him leave WrestleMania the winner? I think that gets a lot of heat. I think it's a ton of heat. And I think what they really like, and you're seeing this with WWE, and we've been seeing it for a number of years. And that's part of the reason why Logan Paul is even there. They like that social media influence. They like that outside guy. And Logan Paul's a guy who I know you said he's, he's an influencer. But I think that's kind of discrediting what he's done and what he is. He's a very good wrestler. He has stepped into a WWE ring very, very green. And at no point has he ever really showed that he's green. Uh, the, the match against Rey Mysterio, we talked about how he basically saved Rey Mysterio's life and he did it on the fly because Rey came up short. Like That's an intelligence and that's an athleticism that you just don't find. On top of that, he has built himself. He's able to promote himself, and WWE likes that because they feel like you're able to promote their brand, you're able to promote their shows. I mean, he's the guy who got to officially confirm something that we had talked about with SummerSlam going to, to Cleveland. He was the guy who got to announce that. He was the guy who got to break that news. So they like him being in these positions, and I think it would make 100% total sense if he walks out the champion because now he can say, I've won up. And you've seen it on on Friday Night SmackDown. They put the graphic up. Randy Orton, one of the most decorated wrestlers in WWE history. 20 championships. Kevin Owens, one of the biggest names in wrestling. Going from the indie scene to WWE, he's done it all, and he's one of the best. Logan Paul getting a win over those two guys, I think it helps elevate not just himself, but you talked about that, that, that television or that U.S. championship being a television championship. I think it helps elevate that belt, make that belt look a little bit more important. Because I agree with you. I feel like that belt's kind of an afterthought. To me, that belt on Logan Paul is the prop. 
And we, we've talked about belts being props in the past. That belt on Logan Paul is a prop. It, it has no meaning or no value to me. It's just kind of there. It's just supposed to remind me that he's done a thing or two. I don't necessarily need that for Logan Paul. But if you go in there and you beat Randy Orton and you beat Kevin Owens and you're able to hold on to that belt, it adds a little bit more depth to, to your title run, adds a little bit more meaning to that belt and what you've done with it in a very short amount of time. So I think you're right. If he can beat these guys at WrestleMania, if that's the direction they go, I think it adds quite a bit to that story. Speaking of adding quite a bit to a story, I am loving what I'm seeing from Damage Control. I this We talked about this before. I wanted... I've wanted Dakota Kai forever and a day to be the leader of damage control. I wanted her to be the face of it. Yeah, you've got EO. Yeah, you've got Asuka. Yeah, you got Kyrie Sane. But I wanted, I wanted uh, Dakota Kai to be the voice and to be the mouthpiece and to have a bit of a look to her. And I think I got it on Friday night. I think Friday night they hit the nail on the head for me. I thought she looked fantastic. I thought her looking like the actual leader, the actual brains behind the operation. We all know that Bailey set it up, but to me, it feels like Dakota Kai was always in on the joke and Dakota Kai was always the one pulling the strings. And to me, I think it makes the most sense with her being almost this sadistic cerebral leader of this group, of this band of merriment. I, I love what I'm seeing from damage control. I love the, the, the wolf pack mentality that they have. Uh, I like the fact that they beat down Bailey and then Naomi came out to help and they beat down Naomi as well. I thought it was a really good showing for damage control to help elevate this group and elevating these factions is important. This is something we'll talk about later on when we get to AEW because I feel like a faction is getting stepped on just a little bit. But I feel like it's really important to elevate these factions because you elevate everybody in the faction. It's not just the group itself. You are raising everybody up. All of a sudden, Dakota Kai looks much more lethal. Uh, Asuka, she's always been lethal, but you're bringing Kyrie Sane along and you're reintroducing her to, to the WWE universe because it's been a little bit, right? Now she looks like she's got a little bit of an edge. EO Sky, she's the women's champ. We haven't really seen her defend the belt a whole lot, right? And you tend to sometimes lose, you, you, tend, to, you tend to kind of lose track of people. And you tend to forget about people when they're not on TV, they're not defending their belts. But this helps her look like she is the prize in the group. She is the chosen one. When really and truly, I believe it's Dakota Kai who is doing things for her own selfish reasons. And I love it. And I think it's fantastic. What are you thinking about this look that we got? Are you in lockstep with me? Or am I just kind of making some of this up as I'm going along? Because this is what I want to see. No, I think it's it's clear. It's a group that started a couple of years ago and now is kind of weaving into a new phase of their story. And that's great. And it's tried and true. You know, groups break up all the time. And I just think that now, I think when Triple H sees the vision for this group, now there can be maybe even a higher ceiling without Bailey. And sometimes, you know, you recognize, okay, the beginning of a faction needs that kind of star leader at first to kind of help the others kind of get up to speed in regards to that quote unquote superstar presentation. And yeah, these ladies ha had something already with their time in NXT and their work in the WWE system, but in front of an audience, you know, r remember they debuted at SummerSlam. So you automatically get that big push. So now you have a, a different version of Bailey and you recognize the others can now stand on their own legs and be really spectacular. And it, it, the most important thing in any feud is interest. And I think a lot of people are interested in what's going to happen. And I think SmackDown did a great job in allowing them to kind of adva advance their story. It was well done. I'm going to throw a name out there. And I'm not sure if you are incredibly familiar with her or not. We've talked a little bit about her in the news and notes segments. We've not really talked about any of her matches. But I think it was last weekend, uh, Julia, she wrestles in stardom over in New Japan, which is the same area where um, – same same group that Asuka, uh, Kairi Sane, and Io Sky all came from. They all came from stardom. Julia was the NW the, – the New Japan Pro Wrestling Women's Champion. Uh, she was supposed to have a match with Mercedes Monet. New Japan, Mercedes Monet couldn't come to an agreement. We're going to talk about her debut with AEW here very shortly. Um, but Julia was supposed to have a match with her and the belief was she was going to drop the belt to Mercedes Monet. Didn't happen. Julia ends up dropping the belt anyways to another wrestler. 
Uh, everybody believes this signals her time in stardom is done. There's been a lot of interest from WWE. Does Julia make an appearance at WrestleMania and join Damage Control? Again, uh, she is she's an Asian Italian. Uh, what is she? She's Italian and Japanese, and I think she's she's grew up in Japan. I think from her family lineage, so she has a very unique look to her. Um, but obviously, being another Japanese female joining that group, you can do pretty much what you want to do with her. I think you could maybe bypass NXT with her, or if you wanted to, you could do double time, have her in NXT running a show, and have her up on the main roster doing stuff with Damage Control. Maybe she joins Damage Control. And maybe she causes Bailey to lose this match because they've recruited a new member and you added another layer to that story and you added a little bit more depth. Would you be in favor of adding a wrestler who is, if you are strictly a WWE fan, she is relatively unknown. If you are a major wrestling fan, you know who she is. You've at least heard of her. Would you be in faction of adding this person on one of the biggest shows in a match that has Bailey in? We can make the argument Bailey should win this title. Do you, would you be in favor of adding that to damage control to help strengthen damage control even more? Yeah, absolutely. Great name. And I think that, you know, it's, it's interesting in that you maybe just need to do a couple of vignettes to kind of introduce the, the non-hardcore fan to what she brings to the table. But yeah, that's a great name, a great addition to the faction. Oh boy, would that be intriguing in a lot of significant ways to have that happen. So man, WrestleMania, we didn't even talk about the potential for surprises, what could happen, the swerves the pomp and circumstances, do they have a major debut? The two nights, because they're approaching really quickly, and I'm getting more and more excited to see potentially what's going to happen night one, night two. It's a, it's a big deal, and WrestleMania week is always a big deal, and you just brought up a name that's now intriguing, now going to catch up on her matches. I, I've heard, Obviously, you've talked to me about the name, but she's not been top of mind um, in regards to what I've been thinking about, but my goodness. See, good job, because you got me more interested in the WWE <laughs> women's division at this point, yes, I can't wait to see what's going to happen with the women, Bailey, damage control, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming months, even beyond WrestleMania. Yeah, and look, I think this week you're right. I think WWE hit the ball out of the park. I think they really hit their stride. And look, it could have been they had more promo time to do other things with other guys. It could have been the fact that we really have confirmed three additional matches on this card for these two nights. It could be a lot of things. But I think WWE is doing a really good job, not just hitting that strike, not just adding to the card, but still keeping up and developing stories and developing talking points. I think we both agree. Some of this Cody, Seth, Roman, Rock story was starting to kind of slow down, starting to bog down. And I was talking to Alyssa about this, just kind of we're having a conversation where wrestling was going on. And I was like, oh, they could do a couple of different things. They could they, they have multiple endings that they could do with this Cody, Seth, Roman, Rock match on night one and that will really have an impact on night two and it could be really really interesting and what you got this week was in a sit down with um with cody rhodes was the sowing of the seeds of doubt with seth rollins pulling on that history that these men have pulling on the fact that these guys have been very vocal about not liking each other for pretty much the first two or three years that cody was there uh seth rollins basically not respecting Cody, but not giving him his due and Cody having nothing but respect for Seth, but just coming out and saying, we just don't really get along. We're just, our personalities just kind of clash. And they leaned into that this week on WWE. They leaned into the fact that these guys had three matches. They leaned into this, that, that Cody ended up beating Seth with that torn pack. And that these guys went to war together against each other. Building all of this. And, and Cody, I thought, cut one of the better babyface promos and did a fantastic job pulling you in. Cody always talks about his mom, always gives out a, a tear or two. He's able to squeeze it out. It was really, really good. It was a really good promo. But it helps set up this thought process that we could have a couple of different endings for the story. It's not as cut, as cut and dry as Cody and Seth winning and, and Roman and Rock losing. And that may be starting to, to kind of break up Roman and Rock. It's not just as simple as that. You've got a couple of different ways you can go. And I'd like to present to you a couple of endings, and I want to know how you would book this. And, and if one of these endings that I'm presenting to you isn't on your list or you don't like it, if you have a different one, please present it because I want to know how you would book this because I think WWE did a really nice job 
setting them up, setting themselves up for a little bit of leeway, setting themselves up for the ability to go in multiple directions depending on what they want to do. They did not pigeonhole themselves. They do that sometimes. They box themselves in, and it's like you have to go this way. With this story, they've now opened up multiple doors that you can walk through. And one of these doors you can walk through is Cody and Seth just outright beating Roman and The Rock. That is the one that I think everybody kind of thought we were going to get and what we, what we had assumed. The other one we could get, you could get Seth turning on Cody – allowing Roman and The Rock to get the win. Everything Roman has been saying, or everything that The Rock has been saying about Seth comes true. Seth turns on Cody and costs him. And just now we build more hurdles for Cody to have to get by. You could have Roman turn on The Rock. This relationship, there seems to be a little animosity. There's a little tension there. Sometimes we can cut it with a knife. Sometimes it seems like they want to play in the same sandbox together and are willing to share toys. But Roman could turn on The Rock, or you could have Rock turn on Roman. And in some way or another, this match ends up costing Rock what he really, or cost, costing Roman what he really wanted, which was the Bloodline Rules match against Cody Rhodes. Cody and Seth get the win, and Cody ends up going in there one on one, no Bloodline allowed, because one of these two men turned on each other in this match. Or. I'm going to throw a fourth one out there that I just thought of. We talked about Tamatanga coming in. We talked about Tamatanga being part of the bloodline because uh, Samoan history, they acknowledge each other. They acknowledge each other's family. And because of that, they're looked upon as a cousin to both Rock and to Roman. Tamatanga plays a part. You've got Roman and you've got Rock. They're up against the ropes. Things are, are about to go down. Cody, Seth, somebody's about to make a pin. All of a sudden, a mysteriously hooded figure comes in. And pulls that wrestler out, knocks them out, hits said uh, the referee's distracted, hits the other wrestler, rolls them back in the ring for the one, two, three. Just sets it up where it's even harder now for Cody. He's got to go through those bloodline rules. And we get an additional member to the bloodline. Or if Rock is willing to stay around because we know he's got movies coming up, the Rock starts to build his own faction to compete against Roman. And somewhere along the line, maybe at SummerSlam, we get that Roman rock story that we've been looking for. How would you book this? I just gave you four alternate endings. Any one of these could be true. None of these could be true. Is there one that you like and that you would go with, or is there something different that you would like to see? See, I'm of the opinion, and I, I think that's the rumor that you're hearing, is that they want it so that Cody faces the longest odds. And I think that you got to kind of change it up a little bit with Seth Rollins. So in my opinion, I think that, if you're going to have potentially Drew McIntyre take the belt, uh, I think that potentially you need to have Seth Rollins align himself with Roman Reigns, bloodline rules, every odd stacked against, every odd stacked against Cody Rhodes. And then going into it, it's just looking like a million things are going to go against him. And then you have the debut on night two of all the family members that are going to join. And it's like six on one. You get Cody getting strapped. Uh, like The Rock said, and, and he just keeps fighting back. Kind of like Rocky. You know, you tell the Rocky story. In Philadelphia, he keeps getting beat. He keeps getting, you know, maybe you have four, five, six false finishes where the Roman just keeps looking befuddled every single time. And then you have the opportunity where in the biggest moment, against all the odds, against everything, against the newly formed, you know, union with Seth Rollins, uh, with G with Jimmy Uso beating his ass, with The Rock beating his ass, six seven on one, Cody overcomes and becomes the world champ. I think that even adds to the pop that's going to happen when it goes down. Because if The Rock goes away, then you have the shock of oh my goodness, we didn't we failed. He's got to come back one more time after WrestleMania to kind of clear things up one more time to kind of uh, indicate to. to uh, Roman, hey, we, we had a setback, but you're still the guy and, and go after it and, and, and keep it going. Because I think Cody Rhodes' first feud after WrestleMania has to be against one guy, and that's Roman Reigns one more time. And I think that it'll be a, a fun situation. However they go, you presented great endings. It's going to be crazy to think about how, how they did it and how they accomplished what they did, man. We're only a month away, and please don't let nothing derail what everybody is excited for. Everyone's... Um, Everyone's really excited for what's going to happen and night two at WrestleMania. Yeah, everybody is excited for night two at WrestleMania. 
Uh, something else we should be excited for. They've added another match to that card. Like I said, this was a good week. Continuing to build, continuing to develop this card, continuing to add to it. We had a gauntlet match for the right to face Gunther at WrestleMania 40. Now, Sami Zayn and Chad Gable got to the very end. They've done a great job with these backstage vignettes with Chad Gable. Chad Gable versus Gunther has been a great match. They've had a great couple of matches uh, earlier this year. It looked like at one point Chad Gable was going to be the guy to dethrone Gunther for that Intercontinental Championship. Instead, Sami Zayn gets the win and rolls into WrestleMania as the guy who's going to challenge Gunther. And if you listen to to what Booker T says, Booker T says that after this match on the way home, Sami Zayn was a little bit upset because the fans were a little bit brutal to him online. The fans were not as excited that he was the guy going to WrestleMania. Sami Zayn looking for his WrestleMania story, and he gets it, and the fans were pulling for Chad Gable. The fans wanted Chad Gable. I'll be honest with you. I love Sami Zayn, but I think Chad Gable would have been the better fit here. I wanted to see Chad Gable go against Gunther again. I thought the matches that they had were fantastic. I wanted to see Chad Gable dethrone Gunther. I wanted that to be the ending at WrestleMania. I thought that would have been much better than us possibly feeding Sami Zayn to Gunther or or Sami Zayn getting the win over Gunther. I wanted Chad Gable involved in this match. What are your thoughts? Was Sami Zayn the right call here? Was he the guy to face Gunther at WrestleMania? Or should it have been Chad Gable? Man, it was crazy because Sami Zayn came out and said that he got hurt by the heat that he got from the fans. He indicated that, man, uh, I was a main eventer. I was somebody that built a connection with the fans. And for them to kind of, you know, express publicly and loudly that they weren't into the finish, that was crazy to see. I thought that was a, the other note um, that I added from this week was, man, Sami Zayn uh, maybe needs that heel turn. Maybe needs to get back and do something, you know, because of the fact that... No, no, I think the match is great. I think that, look, Sami Zayn winning the Intercontinental title is not beneath him. Fans, those that are explaining what happened, say that, well, Sami's already done it. It's not unique. But winning it off of Gunther puts Sami in a different spot. And I think maybe he takes it and then turns heel right there at WrestleMania because of the fact that, you know, the fans turned on him. But whatever they do, Sami Zayn's a star. I don't think... Look, star appeal... Chad, I know Chad Gable is a, a nice, cute story. People like him, but no, in no way is that a bigger match than Sami Zayn versus Gunther at WrestleMania. So you say Sami Zayn was the right call yes, then? Yes, Sami was the right call. No doubt about it. All right. Was there anything else in WWE before we transitioned to AEW that caught your caught your eye or, or that you wanted to expound upon this week? No, it's good, good week of wrestling. Lot good, to go through. Good, good week of wrestling for WWE. They did a lot to get that build for WrestleMania, and uh, it's going to be some good stuff, man. Good stuff. It's it's coming quick. Oh man, it, it's going to be a fun time, especially with what happens after the fact. Oh my goodness, it's going to be great. All right. Well, on Wednesday we had probably the worst kept secret in all of wrestling. Uh, she signed with AEW back in what it sounds like January. Uh, she's been kept on the shelf because they wanted to debut her in Boston, in her hometown. They basically went um, control C, control P from from the CM Punk debut, and they did it here for Mercedes Monet. I, I want to get your take on what you thought of her debut. I myself don't understand what the CEO thing is. I don't get it, but I thought it was cool to watch the crowd just explode and go crazy. I was excited for her to come out and cut her promo. She got emotional and she was overwhelmed. I thought that was fantastic. All that being said, seeing her in both New Japan and seeing her now in AEW, I do not feel as though she is as big of a star as she was in WWE. I don't feel like she carries the same pizzazz that she carried when she was in WWE. And it could be the fact that she is just a face because she is a better heel than she is a face. Right now she is displaying face tendencies. Maybe if she becomes heel, maybe it gets ratcheted up. Maybe it goes from, from a six or seven all the way up to a 10. But for right now, I felt like her debut for me left me wanting more. I was not completely sold by her debut and I was kind of there like, well, I mean, this is kind of what it's been is what it was in new Japan. This is what it is here. It is not the same person we have from WWE and I guess that's okay, but I don't even necessarily need Sasha Banks. But what I need is I need that star power that Sasha Banks had 
And I don't feel like I get it on any other screen but a WWE screen because she's been in New Japan. Now she's in AEW, and it just does not feel the same. What were your thoughts on her debut? Yeah, well, it doesn't feel the same because she's only worked like four times, and we're used to seeing her every week. We're used to Sasha Banks. We're used to that level. Now, real fast, I just want to tighten something up because it just came across my screen here. I am not a fan in any capacity of the WWE wrestlers participating in this GCW blood sport. Um, I think it's crazy oh, to, it's to think Shayna Baszler is joining Baszler, GCW. Dominic, I, I think that's crazy. Triple H needs to button that shit up, especially the week of WrestleMania. Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, no way. I, I think GCW is pretty extreme too. It's, yeah, no, it's no, not, no, 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 no. That's it's, that. Uh, it's I, like ECW lights. Yeah, I, I don't think that needs to be happening. But I, I don't get it. Well, hopefully, no serious consequences come from that. Um, I get the idea of letting wrestlers want it to make more money elsewhere, um, but take care of your wrestlers. And that's another sign that people are saying, hey, of the three free agents that went to AEW, Triple H couldn't overspend for one of them. He didn't need all three. Maybe even Sasha Banks, bring her back. I mean, come on and say, hey, we're going to. There has been talks that they botched the Will Ospreay signing. Yeah, like yeah. they screwed up the yeah. Will Ospreay signing. Yeah, one of the three. You don't need all three, just one. But in the end, you look at it, and it's it's the new version of Sasha Banks, which is Mercedes Monet. And obviously, the Monet part, the CEO is boss, you know, Sasha, Sasha Banks, boss bitch. So, yeah, the CEO chants from the music is a little contrived, but it's per- I thought it was absolutely perfect for branding. Now you have something. Every good wrestler needs a chant. Every good wrestler needs something that they can put on shirts or market. Now, CEO is tough because it's universal. But I think it's great. The, the CEO, Mercedes Monet, that, that's just perfect. And it, it's just absolutely flows. It hits on brand. Yeah, the entrance, it was a little long. You, you made it make sense to me because I was like, you're, you're right. The boss, she's the CEO. Okay, yes, makes sense. I CEO, get it. The she, boss. she couldn't go with the boss because that was a WWE thing. Yeah, I got you. Got okay, it. exactly. I was slow to it. I'm sorry. No, no, it's all good. It, you know, um, the, the blessing of talking, sometimes ideas pop up as we're talking. And I just say it's, it's, it's the beginning. Now you got to actually establish what she said. We're going to be global. We're going to have women's matches. And she's the star. They added another piece. And now slowly they're on par. I think they're not better, but they're on par with WWE's women. And now you got to involve her in some stories and tell some stories that are meaningful. And now it's just the beginning. If we get her weekly, every Wednesday, boom, you have a, a character that is is money and it's something that you just have to do. And it's something, too, which is interesting. I don't think I, I saw it on the rundown. Even though the ratings are not, you know, reflective of the fact, this is just the beginning. They I think, stayed the exact same exactly. from the previous week. And, bull, and, bull, and Bully Ray asked what needs to happen. And I, and I think I gave, you know, usually I clown around on Twitter. I think I gave one of my most astute tweets to Bully Ray. And I said, you know what? AEW needs a gimmick. They need a Logan Paul. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I don't know if I put it in the tweet at Detroit Podcast, but in the end, you need kind of like a Mr. Beast kind of manager that just shows up with 45 mi- million views across 50 different social media platforms to get more general eyes on the product. Because right now, AEW has their million fans, which are the marks. Most of those people that are mm-hmm. watching are the marks. But if you want to double that, look what WCW did. They brought in Carl Malone, Jay, Jay Leno. WWE's doing it too with all the stars, with Logan Paul and all the fans. So AEW's got to take a step forward because, yeah, they've invested in three in three people and didn't move the needle in television ratings. That's kind of crazy in my thought. I at least thought you'd get like a 1.1, you know, at least cross a million. But I think people don't, and I think people said it. in the. If you go look at Bully Ray, he's a great wrestling commentator. And he asked He's the got question, great insight. Great insight and really professional, with years of experience, years of knowledge. But here's the thing that people said is AEW doesn't do good PR. Like WWE pops a rating on SmackDown. What do we see? We see a graphic. WWE got 2% more viewers uh, with the week of of 315 to 316 uh, highlighted by the rocks. It's like, oh my God, they overdo it where it's like, oh my God, I I can't go anywhere without seeing a WWE graphic of how great they are and how much money they made and how much the rating, you know what I mean? That you have to do it. And I think AEW does not do PR anywhere near the level that they should have. You know what I mean? I would have done it differently with uh, Mercedes Monet. You would have had uh, more promos about it, more, more, more across different domains, wrestlers talking about it um, on their social media platforms. It just seems like MJF did it. It seems like a couple AEW stars used their platforms, 
but not at the same. Look, you, you got Drew McIntyre filming himself cussing out CM Punk. They're they're understanding the game of social media to drive their traffic back to their stuff. AEW's got us ramp it up like two thousand percent, and then you'll start to see a reflection in the ratings. Sasha Banks, aka now Mercedes Monet, is a star. I think they got a good one, but the beginning now you, you built the foundation. Now you can't build you can't build a shitty house. You gotta put the pieces together and have some matches that people talk about. For sure. And to draw a comparison to what you're saying. AEW basically markets themselves the same way I market myself, while WWE markets themselves the same way you market yourself in Detroit Sports Podcast. Yeah, exactly. You Probably gotta, the most accurate way I could put that. You gotta, you gotta be, yeah, you gotta be everywhere all the time, saying your name, saying DSP, saying this, saying that. Exactly. You got to do it, um, even to the point where people are grossed out by it and say, "Stop doing it." But that's how. That's the only way. Like good attentions, and it's simple PR, which is. Any attention is good attention, even if it's bad attention. So MJF became the master of it, but he went away. So in the end, we could say that the decline of AEW over the last six months maybe started coinciding with uh, the the last couple months of MJF being injured because it kind of took the uh, took away their their little spirit there and a little bit of their grit. Yeah, it took away uh, a definite mouthpiece, somebody who's incredibly yeah. vocal. Now, what I thought was interesting was if you hung out to the end of AEW Dynamite, and if you look at ratings like you brought up, it seemed like a lot of people left before the ending. Um, Mercedes Monet showed up. Julia Hart showed up before uh, with Sky Blue, and they attacked Willow Nightingale. And to me, Julia Hart has been a fascinating case of somebody figuring it out, building an organic connection with the crowd, and getting a very good run and doing a great thing with her gimmick and just letting it all hang out every single week. She is one of, she's your TNT, she's your TBS champion. She is one of the faces of your women's division right now because you don't have Britt Baker. Uh, You don't really have anybody to hang your hat on. Jade Cargill's gone. So Julia Hart is kind of your new, one of your new leaders in in the clubhouse for the women's division. Julia Hart has done a fantastic job of not only just getting herself over, but helping to also elevate Sky Blue. Julia Hart and Sky Blue go to attack Willow Nightingale. Out comes Mercedes Monet. And I want to get your take because I feel like commentary buried her in in a very simple comment that they made. I feel like all of the work that she has done was completely undermined by commentary. And I I think it sets a poor precedence because this wrestler – has done an absolute fantastic job. If you go back to where she was, she was with Brian Pillman Jr. and the other guy who we can't even remember his name, and she was a cheerleader for these guys. She was able to work herself up into a position where she joined House of Black, and honestly, if you ask me, she is the most important member of House of Black. House of Black isn't even on TV half the damn time, and that's because uh, What's-His-Nuts doesn't want to lose any matches. So... Julia Hart has done a great job of really working on herself and, and building herself and not just that elevating other female wrestlers around her for her to get into a match or in a, in a little bit of a dust up, we'll say with Mercedes Monet, Mercedes Monet hits three moves, Julia Hart laid out and commentary highlighted that commentary said Mercedes Monet quickly dispatches Julia Hart with three quick, easy moves completely cuts her legs out from underneath her in my estimation. And I feel like a lot of the hard work she did, they just took a steel chair to it and just threw it in the garbage because Mercedes Monet showed up on screen. What are your thoughts? I'm not sure if you caught that, but now hearing it maybe for the first time, what are your thoughts on commentary saying that Julia Hart was, was dispatched in three easy moves by Mercedes Monet one to help elevate Monet, but two to me, it felt like it really cut the legs out of Julia Hart. Oh, man, that's crazy because, no, I did not because what happened was the way I watched Dynamite, I was so amped by the Will Ospreay promo that it was like, boom, yeah. get up, get off the ground. So I was good. I just lowered the volume, watched it, watched it and said, I don't need that anymore. And to me, it just goes to show you, yeah, another aspect of AEW that's got to improve is their commentary, you know, 
I don't feel like if you turn it down, you miss anything. So to me, sometimes you watch oh. it, you, you highlight it, and then the missus will say, hey, you kind of got the TV too loud, and I'm just like, oh, my God. And I just overcorrect and just turn it off and then uh, chat with the kids and then and have it on in the background. So after Will Ospreay, I was just like, whoo I'm excited. I'm good. And then the, uh, the Jay White match got me good, and I was excited, and it, that was crazy. So to me, by that point, yeah, I turned the volume off, and, and I didn't have – that uh, reaction to it, but that's crazy that they did that. But, you know, to me, Julia Hart, I think, can easily rebound, and I think that when she does her thing, and if that's a feud or however the next step is, I think her involvement in the House of Black has been cool. But, uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, people get buried in, in the name of putting over somebody else, and uh, right now, it's it's Mercedes Monet's world, and we're all just living in it, and let's see who gets, the, uh, who gets buried as a result of this new top star in AEW and let's see if uh Julia Hart has some things to say and how she rebounds because that's always good is that you know in the end everyone at some point's got to lay down on the mat for a one two three but they can still those that are great can take a loss and can take a verbal beating or some commentary burying them and they'll still shine and she's got that look so if done right creatively Julia Hart I think will be okay Speaking of getting buried, now look, I'm not I don't want to say that this faction is buried, but I don't feel like you can take this faction serious at all. The Undisputed Kingdom, yeah. we talked about this a couple weeks ago, man. They at some point they've got to start racking up W's because what are we doing putting all these guys in matches and all they do is lose all the time? Are we just waiting for Adam Cole to get healthy so he can come wrestle again? He might be two months away. We don't know. Wardlow ends up losing to Samoa Joe. Now, look, I wouldn't take the belt off of Joe. I think a real easy way to book this is you don't have to have Wardlow have a match immediately with Samoa Joe. You could have Wardlow waiting in the wings for whatever your next pay-per-view is, for uh, a pay-per-view down the road. You don't need to have Wardlow cash this in, cash his win in from from the the, the multi-man match that you had on your last pay-per-view two weeks later. You just don't have to do it. It's not necessary. So I wouldn't have even had this match happen because I want Wardlow looking strong. I want Wardlow looking big. I want Wardlow looking mean. And yeah, through most of this match, Samoa Joe sold for him. He did look be big. He did look mean. He looked bean. That's what I'm going to call it. He looked big and mean. Mean. But in the end, Wardlow ends up losing. And again, Undisputed Kingdom, if you were to look at their record as a faction, has more L's than they have W's. I don't know how you take these guys seriously, especially if you are a, a wrestler and you're not sure who Matt Taven is. You're not sure who Mike Bennett is. You have really no idea of what their careers really span. If you if you remember Mike Bennett from a, from WWE, basically he's a simp and, and he was a guy who was fed to everybody else. So that's probably how you look at him in AEW. Matt Taven's an incredible wrestler. A couple weeks ago, he had a fantastic match. It's cool that Roddy got the belt in, in, at the pay-per-view, but you got a dude on one leg in Adam Cole. Your big guy just lost to another big guy, so he's not even the most lethal big guy in, in AEW, and that's not what you want to do. You want to build him up to be a freaking monster. Your, your undercard tag team of, of Taven and, and Bennett were just destroyed a couple of weeks ago, and, and to me, it just doesn't feel like this faction has any legs. It doesn't feel like they're getting the adequate push to make you interested in them. And that is frustrating because you want to buy into what Adam Cole is selling. You want to buy into the fact that Roddy could be a really good wrestler. I want people to be invested in a guy like Matt Taven because he's incredible. And we've seen it with Wardlow. We've seen Wardlow at the highest of highs. And to me right now, he just feels like he is a very mid-card guy. Does something have to change with Undisputed Kingdom? Does the booking around them have to be corrected? Because I can't take them serious. I don't know if you can take them serious as a faction. No, you're absolutely right. And it's crazy because you start to see the Young Bucks with Okada. That looks like a real legitimate faction. And, yes. And, and the side-by-side -side view of um, the, the Young Bucks flexing and Okada in the middle just looks cool. It's very cool, very intriguing. No, absolutely. I'm not intrigued at all by the Undisputed Kingdom. I think that they're just together because you need something for Adam Cole. It doesn't have substance, doesn't have, yeah, you put a belt on him, but you haven't done enough 
to make it so that people can get invested in care other than the star power of Adam Cole. And guess what? He's got a boot on his leg. And that's mm-hmm. the problem is you have a faction that is led by a guy that's injured. So the how relevant can they be? And maybe they're taking it slow. They're starting to build up their credibility. But yeah, no, they, you're absolutely right. Creatively, they're not doing a good enough job of making them seem like, okay, we need to be threatened by these people. And that's just the way it is. That's the way it's going to be for a minute. And you're absolutely right. Why not tell a story about Wardlow and uh, Samoa Joe and even take it beyond the pay-per-view? I mean, it's kind of like a pseudo money in the bank and Wardlow could rack up wins, could cost Samoa Joe a match or two that's not for the title, get in his way, be a pest, a power bomb through a table. I mean, Wardlow's like, okay, I'm going to cash it in, then I'm going to lose, <laughs> which is kind of how it's been. It's like AEW feels like the the, the wrestling world's going to end this week, and you could have just held on to that for something. You know, I know you needed a match for the card that you had there, uh, big business, and it makes sense timing wise to have a lot of intriguing things, but you could have did a lot more. And all you had to do was just have Samoa Joe cut a promo. I'm the best. I'm going to prove I'm the best. Wardlow comes out, then Swerve comes out, little physicality, you get to the next week. But I just think that sometimes, yeah, you and I are, you know, with matches that you recognize have the appeal, you could get a lot more out of it than a one-off two weeks later. Yeah, it just, uh, I think you and I both subscribe to the theory of of build the story around the guys and let the guys just kind of put that final chapter in the mat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It just... Let, let's 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 create something where we get some real heat where eyes really want to view it. And I think that would also go back to their ratings. If, you know, we had a, a three, four week build with Wardlow, Samoa Joe. And, and look, this is a story I just thought of while you were talking. Basically, Samoa Joe is like, Wardlow, get down here. Let's do this. Let's fight. And Wardlow's like, nah, not doing it right now. And Wardlow holds this power over Samoa Joe. Remember, Samoa Joe is the champion. And you get Samoa Joe increasingly paranoid, and Wardlow's kind of sneak attacking him for a couple of weeks. And like you said, almost like a pseudo money in the bank, Wardlow a couple weeks down the road, after possibly injuring Samoa Joe, Samoa Joe's too prideful to say no. He then says, I want you tonight. And this is after he attacks him. I think it makes for a great story. I think going into that match that night, after Samoa Joe being injured and coming into the match a little bit lame, I think it makes for a more compelling story for you. And look, Wardlow could lose by his own by his own accord, right? He gets a little too aggressive. Uh, he ends up ripping a, a, a cover off of a ring rope, and he goes flying in for uh, a shoulder, or he gets flung into a turnbuckle, and he gets busted wide open, and he gets knocked out. That's not a bad way to lose, especially after the last four weeks where you've caused all this torment for your champion. And now your champion is increasingly paranoid. That was the one thing I thought was great about when Samoa Joe won this. He seemed like he was kind of paranoid with with uh, Swerve Strickland and, um, and, and Hangman Page. He seemed like he was kind of on edge. I think having that delusional paranoid champion is a cool story for Samoa Joe to roll with. And Wardlow kind of pushing those buttons shows that Wardlow's not just – a big meaty man. He's a guy who's a little bit cerebral. He needs to be taken serious. You help elevate him and you put him on this level where he not just physically can go at it with Samoa Joe, but mentally can challenge him as well. Uh, You brought up Will Ospreay's promo. I just want to let you gloat about it because I thought it was fantastic. Uh, Bruv is my new word. I run around the house. I call my wife Bruv. Uh, When the baby comes, I think it's going to be baby Bruv. I think the word bruv is great. The crowd was chanting bruv. Um, I watch a lot of English TV when I get a chance to, and I love English slang, and bruv is one of those words that they just throw around like crazy, and Will Ospreay getting to be authentic Will Ospreay is absolutely fantastic to me. He is not watered down. He is not diluted. He is everything that he is supposed to be, and it is fantastic to me. I loved his promo. Uh, I, look, go ahead and talk about it because you mentioned that it was the highlight of the show for you. And I thought it was great. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, well, it's crazy because it's double edged sword in my mind. I look at it and I say, okay, well, there's a star and this is what a star looks like. And this is how a star acts, walks to the ring, carries himself. I'm the best. This is why I'm the best. I'm going to prove it. Going to give my respect to the others. And I, I respect the way in which he carried himself. But then it tells me, well, why does nobody else kind of look like that? 
Why is everybody else kind of just carrying themselves like, okay, I'm a hard ass or I want to do crazy ass moves. And it's like, it's a vast difference. So I don't know if it's set up intentionally that way to be able to establish this guy as a star, but oh my God, it's like a night and day difference. It, it was great. It was like, bro, I'm the feeling. I'm the best. Let's go. I got to prove it. And I definitely want to see the match with him and Danielson. And uh, he just took the mic and owned it. And it's just the culmination of what a true star should look like. But I think that AEW could kind of do that with a couple other people. And that's all that they, they, the AEW's got to do a little better job overall, like 5% better across the board. So I look at it and I say, holy cow. Thank you, goodness, for Will Ospreay and what he does, the presentation, the way in which he delivers the message, the fact that the crowd is into it, they like what he's doing, and I'm really happy, and it's going to be great to see what happens when Will Ospreay gets a year into this, when it's Will Ospreay versus Samoa Joe or Will Ospreay versus MJF. Good Lord, Will Ospreay versus the whole world. We all want to see it, and I'm down for a promo, baby, and he, he definitely comes in with energy. Uh, comes in like a fighting spirit and, and everything like that. So we'll see what happens. All right, man. What was uh, what was your show of the week this week? I thought it was Dynamite. I thought that, you know, even though you look at it and you say, okay, you could have had some different... I thought the matches were, were stellar. I thought that it kind of kept your intrigue. And yeah, I know people are not into spot fests, but in the end, I thought that Dynamite had themselves a good show that at least introduced a star that is going to be intriguing. And when you have Will Ospreay Cup, maybe a top five promo of the year, you got to give it to Dynamite, in my opinion. Dynamite for me was a incredibly close second. I thought SmackDown did a really good job of uh, building stories for WrestleMania. That is something that had me interested from the get. I wanted to see how we're going to fill this card out. Uh, we've got confirmation of a couple of matches that were added to this WrestleMania card that looked very intriguing. Uh, I'm intrigued by the LA Knight. AJ Styles match. Uh, I don't want a, 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 a triple threat match of Randy Orton and, and Kevin Owens and Logan Paul, but you know what? Now I know it's on the card, and I know it's going to be a great match because every match Logan Paul's in is a fantastic match. So we've got to build some more to WrestleMania, and that, for that reason, I'm going to give my half a point to SmackDown. So either way, I think you can go. you got four hours of wrestling right there. Take a watch. I think you'll be, you'll be happy with it. You ready for some news and notes? Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? More information is coming out in the Vince McMahon sex trafficking lawsuit. In a new report by Tim Marchman, Brandon Thurston, and John Pollock for Front Office Sports, they have confirmed the identities of four parties listed as corporate officers one through four in the court filing. The report goes on to list corporate officer number one as Nick Khan. Corporate officer number two as Brad Blum, number three as Stephanie McMahon, and number four as Brad Nurse. The front office sports independently identified Khan and Blum, as well as two other anonymous corporate officers whom the suit refers. They would also ask Janelle Grant's lawyer, Ann Callis, whether it was report whether its reporting was accurate. And she said, I can confirm that these names are correct. The law- lawsuit just roped in more people. And many more are still working at WWE. We mentioned before that TKO will go scorched earth. It'll be interesting to see how this impacts things at the very top because Nick Khan is very important. Brad Blum, very important. Uh, Brad Nurse, uh, I believe, still works there and is important. Stephanie, obviously, she has left the company. It'll be interesting to see what comes out of this. Now we have splits bill for this on-screen and real-life couple. AJ or AEW star CJ Perry, Lana and WWE has announced that her and her husband Miro Rusev uh, in, in WWE, they have separated after seven years of marriage. The pair began dating during their time together in WWE NXT before infamously getting engaged in the summer of 2015 during an ongoing storyline breakup between them. A report by TMZ confirms the couple has now officially separated after tying the knot back in 2016 though the two plan to remain friends and work together following their separation. Perry told TMZ, Miro and I have made the difficult decision to separate after many wonderful years together and have decided to move on as friends and hopefully on-screen characters somewhere down the road. TMZ notes that the separation does not come after any kind of fight or cheating and that the two simply grew apart over the years. 
WWE is looking to make a change to its pay-per-view schedule. The start time for both WrestleMania 40 and Money in the Bank 2024 are slated to begin at 7 p.m. Eastern. And speaking to multiple sources, WWE is looking into potentially moving domestic premium live events to that early start time in the future. For years, the start time was the standard 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time start. There has been no final determination about the decision on the pay-per-view start time at this time. I think you and I both agree a 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time would be fantastic for starts of pay-per-views. And finally, this AEW star suffered a real-life injury on Dynamite and has to postpone his plans. Darby Allen took to Twitter on Friday to share a photo of an x-ray showing three bones in his foot that are clearly fractured, and he had also updates on his upcoming climbing quest. Allen wrote, unfortunately, the foot is really broke from Wednesday's match. Everest will have to wait until next year. Fist pump emoji. Uh, TMZ covered the incident that led to the broken foot, noting that despite the spot to end the segment where the Bullet Club gold seemingly crushed his ankle with a steer, steel chair and bat, it was actually a different spot that saw Allen pick up the injury. A front flip earlier in the match saw Allen land awkwardly and injure his foot. However, he continued to wrestle for another 10 minutes. While the spot to end the segment was meant to write Allen off of television and to do his Mount Everest climb, now it seems he will be legitimately recovering from his foot injury instead. And that's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSTROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. Man, what a good week of wrestling. Lots of great content. If you agreed or disagreed with anything that was said today, hit us up. We'd like to know your opinions. Definitely in the world of wrestling, there's so much going on. And then, too, check out if you have, if you're a subscriber of Busted Open at Sirius, they've added a new host. Nick Nemeth is an individual that has conflicting opinions to the hosts, and he shit all over the Cody story. And he said, what, other wrestlers don't have a story to finish? Do you think that Cody just worked his way up to the top and kind of insinuating that he, his run started off because of the fact that potentially he was a Rhodes? So it's so good. He's got a lot of good insights, and he's brought in to kind of rile it up a little bit. And finally, this week's A E uh, this week's A and E uh, stories are going to be great. They're going to highlight in biography the DDP story, and they're going to tell the John Cena versus uh, Rand, uh, Randy Orton feud. So all the, the Scott Hall one was legitimately emotional. It was crazy. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. I DVR both. I watch them religiously, trying to get them off the DVR, but I can't because I just want to go back and watch it. The Scott Hall one was special. It was really good, but incredibly sad. And in the end, you realize that these WWE superstars have lasting legacies, and it's the anniversary of his passing. So we'll have an opportunity to keep reviewing these, and they're really good. Don't miss out because the A&E, they just do a great job. And thanks, everybody, for keeping us, the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast, in the mix when you're listening and looking for wrestling entertainment. Thanks, everybody. We look forward to next week for the latest and greatest edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast podcast.